it is just a wild, um, wild thing we've chosen to do. And Mm -hmm. I love getting to find my fellow, I feel like fellow producers are like my tribe mates in this life because you have to be, you kind of have to be of a certain DNA and cut from a certain cloth to subscribe to this madness that we say yes to (laughs) willingly. Yeah, for Um, sure. So when I find others sprinkled throughout the world, I'm like, you come, I found you, you know. (laughs) Um, So it's really nice to be connecting with you because I, I, I'm very interested in, in particularly obviously learning about your journey, but like how things differ a little in the UK, if they do at all. I mean, the struggle yeah. is the struggle, it sounds like, but, um, yeah. you know, versus what I think majority of people really are got their heads in the sand here with the US, since it's the premier industry here where, I, where I'm at and where, you know, most of the audience listens in from, but, um, but it'll mm-hmm. be really interesting to hear from your perspective, like, you know, any nuggets of info of like mm-hmm. how it differs or how it doesn't and all that jazz but um but yeah I'd love to just dive right in and talk a little bit about your journey and how you discovered this wild world of producing um how I discovered it um I was always just a yeah I mean I always just wanted to work in film and and you know used to watch a lot of film and television when I was younger and I was I'm an only child and um my father sadly passed away so I came from a single parent household um from quite a young age and and uh my mom and I would watch a lot of films and tv together and and you know I just I remember her saying to me once you know you've got to got to do your homework got to get outside like you'll never get a job from watching tv and I was like I will prove you wrong (laughs) (laughs) um um, and we um and yeah and I think I, I always knew I wanted to be in this world I didn't know necessarily that producing was the thing until I was maybe a teenager but I um and I figured out what producing actually meant because obviously you know as is the point of this podcast many many people don't really understand right and 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 at that point at that point how did you think it was like what was the definition in your head of what a producer was um I think truth I you know I wanted to be in charge of of making films and I but I didn't want to be the person who was necessarily like creatively in charge in terms of directing them I I wanted to be using two different sides of my brain I come from a family of brokers like shit broke my both my parents were shit brokers and so negotiating is something that I really enjoy which is weird because a lot of people hate (laughs) it but um but I you know I really like negotiating I like I like using my logical side of my brain but I also am a very creative person and, and you know I love telling stories and and obviously you don't get into this business unless you love telling stories and um so I think that naturally I worked out that the producer was kind of like the the most senior job or exec producer in television or how you know however you want to look at it but in, in film specifically worked out that yeah you know the producer was the the person in charge of everything and not to sound like a horrible micromanager but I, <laughs> like, I like the idea of being having oversight over the whole thing yeah and and yeah so I, I um I didn't really have any connections. I, I, you know, I went to, I went to a university in London and an arts university and I did drama and theater arts and, you know, did a lot of acting and produced plays and wrote plays. And, and uh, at one point thought I wanted to be an actress. Then I, you know, quickly quick, killed that dead because I realized I absolutely didn't want to be an actress after I saw sort of um, two of my like contemporaries, I guess, go up for the same role and kind of fight for, fight for the role in, in mm. this TV show. And I thought, I, I just, I don't want to be in a position where I'm, you know, um, shitting on my friends to yeah. get somewhere for want of a better phrase. Quite, quite um, not a bit suggesting of women, all actors do that. But. Right. Quite, quite a bit of female producers that I've spoken to started out as actors, which I find interesting, oh, really? performers of some kind. Yeah. 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 I think I mean I always used to do it when I was at school. I used to, you know, school and university. I used to be in stage plays and musicals mm-hmm. and things, and I loved it. But I, I just, um, yeah, I felt more comfortable behind the camera or, be- or behind the stage. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I and I, I guess when I was, I was seventeen or eighteen. Um, it's like I said, I didn't really have any connections in into the world, so I, um. I act co- completely by coincidence there was this BBC show called Lark Rise to Candleford which was a sort of Sunday night period drama very popular here ran for three seasons um and they were filming near where my mum lived in out, just outside of Bath and uh one of the um older actresses in the show the wonderful Linda Bassett she was um 
she wanted to live outside of the city and so they ended up renting her my mum had turned her office into a little like airbnb because she wasn't she wasn't working anymore and uh they end up renting this place for for Linda and she was so lovely and really like warm and friendly and she said to me you know come down to the set one day and I'll introduce you to the producer and um so I just went down with her one day and we went I just sort of walked around and watched everything and I was like wow this is amazing I like all yeah. these all these incredible they built all of these incredible cottages and obviously they were just facades there was nothing behind them but they looked so real I was like oh my god I can't believe they built all these houses yeah. and you go inside and it's just a shell but, yeah um, <laughs> it's just like the dream is killed immediately as soon as you walk <laughs> in which is kind of an interesting um I suppose metaphor for producing because I think people think it's so glamorous all the time it's, and the it's facade. just really not it's total yeah. facade yeah it's just um, it's just a two uh two buys you know just kind of showing you the dream but behind the scenes it's just a bunch of sandbags yeah yeah exactly exactly um and that's how I got my first job because I I you know I I got the producer's email address and I and bless her Annie Tricklebank from the BBC and she you know you you name any big period uh period drama from the UK called The Midwife The Night Watch uh Crimson Field like upstairs downstairs she's produced them and she um wow um mm-hmm. and she yeah she was wonderful and I emailed her like <laughs> repeatedly for about two weeks sort of every other day which would now maybe not be acceptable but um trying to get her to give me an internship and I think she eventually emailed me back and said if you stop filling up my inbox I will I will give you an internship on the show um, pause there for a so- second because I I I want to I want to di- dive into this because a lot of people listening they, they they hear about the hustle and you got to like yeah, advocate yeah, yeah. for yourself and you cold email people and nowadays it's so much easier than it's ever been mm-hmm. to find someone's contact info so sure. I, I do think there is a very particular finesse to being mm-hmm. like a squeaky wheel and being someone mm-hmm. who is persistent and, but professional and not annoying mm-hmm. <laughs> to the point where yeah. that person wants to block you and you're just like you know just too much so it's such mm-hmm. a fine line so what if I know it's like hard to describe it but what what do you think yeah. it was about your approach that made her ultimately respond um I think it's such a tough question to ask isn't it I think um it's really I don't know I mean I think just being passionate and enthusiastic and also tailoring obviously you know not making it seem like you've sent this email to a hundred people and you don't really care about what that specific person has done or is doing and and you know showing interest and engaging them I I found always the best way is to actually approach people not asking for anything other than you know, do you have 30 minutes to have a phone call with me or a cup of coffee? Can I buy you a coffee to to hear about your journey, hear where you got to and 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 hear like, you know, uh, yeah, hear about, you know, just hear about their experience because I think most people wouldn't turn down the opportunity to talk about themselves for half an hour, right. you know, it's, it's <laughs> not, not wanting to come across as a narcissist in any way. But I think like, you know, people enjoy telling, telling that kind of story about how they... Yeah got where they are especially in a business where you have to really fight to get where you are so that's right um that's, right. that's certainly like how just before I started Peach House that's certainly the approach that I took with you know I was in a position where I was a little bit unsure about what I wanted to do off the back of a movie that I worked on um called Teen Spirit and I was mm-hmm. sort of thinking I wanted to go into development but then um didn't really think there was I, I sort of couldn't really find anywhere that was this there was kind of creative synergy for me here and I and I just took the opportunity I took a few months off and I emailed every producer I could think of that I some I knew some I didn't know just anyone I you know respected and liked their work and uh, all heads of development at various companies and I met with so many people who all responded and said sure you know I'll have a coffee with you kind of thing which was really lovely and you I swiftly realized that every single person had a different story and a different journey I think there's just no one way to become a producer and um and it was really interesting and really insightful hearing all of these very successful people you know telling me how they how they set their businesses up or how they got into their jobs and what they loved about it and what they didn't love about it and because I wasn't approaching it uh, you know from a place of please give me a job please hire me Um, you know it was much more of a relaxed conversation Uh, and I you know I had the luxury of I had a job and producing commercials and music videos so I I had income it's not you know I wasn't um, I guess some people when they're cold (laughs) yeah I guess I wasn't desperate exactly and and I I think that that can come across so I think if you're cold emailing people it's about um, you're going to get the best response if you're offering 
you know, you know, any you know, offering them something who who ne- they don't need a cup of co- cup of coffee necessarily. But if you're, um, yeah, you're not trying to just get something from them other than you know information, I suppose, and intel. Yeah. I think. I think that was probably always my approach rather than being like, please hire me. I'm desperate for work. I really want to get right. into this business because that email they probably get from a thousand people. Right, um, right. Whereas, you know, the email of, I think what you specifically are doing is really interesting. And I'd love to understand more about how you do it or got there and how, you know, yeah. how you are in your position. That's more flattering to that person, I suppose. Yeah. So. Well, and if you mean it, if you actually mean it. If you it, mean it. Yeah, yeah. Then if you don't it's mean also, it, it comes Right, across. then it sucks. But if you mean it and you're actually really interested in that particular type of, uh, you know, producing or what that particular kind of producer is creating, then you're already positioning yourself to to start a journey on onto something that you already have the interest in, whether that's horror yeah. or, you know, whatever the thing may be. And, right. And that already kind of gets you a step ahead versus just – anybody who's anybody who's carries the title producer should help me it's like being Mm -hmm. really specific I think it's the specificity Mm -hmm. of what you're saying that really makes people feel like oh like wow you really took the time to research this and to go out of your way to email me and we've all been there it's scary to email or call someone you don't know so I think a part of us it's like rewarding that behavior because we've been there Mm -hmm. ourselves and we know how hard that can be but I, I do think that people that just finesse their way into the little crevices it's like oh Mm -hmm. you got in here okay well let's talk then you know like I want to know how you got in because it is so hard and so I think there's a little bit of like that the the creme de la creme that rises to the top and and then you on top of that you have that finesse and that tact Mm -hmm. and that specificity but then you're consistent you know throughout Mm -hmm. sometimes years I mean I've had Mm -hmm. similar to what you're saying even with getting guests on this podcast, I mean, there are certain people I pursue for six months <laughs> before sure, they're I mean, available, like, you know. You know, who am I following? Lynette Hal Taylor. Like, she couldn't be a more impressive person. <laughs> hey, Lynette was one of those people. She emailed me back the same day and was like, sure, let's set it up. She just gets it done. So there's also I mean, that, you know. She's phenomenal. I listen she's to her phenomenal. Episode. Yeah. Like, she's really <laughs> incredible. I know. She's like, I'm like, you're my hero. She's a lot of people's I know. heroes. But, I know. But yeah, like, so- why do I have to follow her? So you're not following her <laughs> this won't be released in the in that in that order you're gonna be months down the line do oh, great. not fear Fine. Fine. plus you're in great company there's no competition it's just a bunch of incredible no, no, I know. women it's a, exactly incre- you know mm. incredible people that you've had on it i'm very humbled to be to and be and to to your point with lynette's episode there is such a theme of luck right there's such mm-hmm. a theme right. of like right place, right time, knowing that one person that randomly knew the guy who was the cousin to the brother. And it's just like, you cannot create that for you yourself. Can't. You, you just, can't. it's I, one but of those it also, I think it's, you can in a way, because I think like, you can't create the luck, obviously. I mean, well, right. actually, I, 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 my mom Nepotism. always used to tell me yeah. this phrase, you know, it's amazing how, um, you know, oh God, now I'm going to forget uh, which way around it goes, but it's, uh, it's amazing how the harder you work the luckier you become mm. um and I always that always stayed with me and I always remember that because I think there's so many people that go oh god you're so lucky you just walked into that job I'm like no I didn't I I toiled at various other jobs to be able to get here I didn't just like waltz in and you know and I and feel I think like it's, that- it's a garden right it's like you're just constantly planting new seeds a lot mm. of them die some you forget about some you actually mourn and mm. some just blossom but yeah it's like years and years in the making and sometimes a seed yeah. you planted you completely forgot about comes back around some would call it luck but you know yeah. it, it just depends yeah. on how you frame it but I think you're right it is Absolutely. it is hard work and I don't mean to take that away from anyone or Lynette but like no, you no. know just like she the way she even got started and and the opportunities that opened for her but she was ready she was willing she had that mm-hmm. enthusiasm mm-hmm. you know so there's also all of that she could have been oh gosh like I don't know how to do this That's I'm just thing. gonna sit back but no she the kind of people that succeed at this are the kinds mm-hmm. of people that lean into whatever is happening around them where they mm-hmm. can seize an opportunity I think we are opportunist in a way you kind of have to be but not in a gross way you know it, it really to to make the best of what's around you and that is I think such a through line for producing 101 you know mm-hmm. how can you make the best version of whatever you have within the confines of what's here now, yeah. you know? So, yeah. yeah. And I think, but also I think it's important to remember that a lot of people don't have the skills to, to, you know, to just pick up the phone and call someone aren't yeah. confident enough to do that or to send a cold email, you know, it's, they're not confident enough 
to 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 do that i'm doing this um there's a, a company here called creative access that's a really brilliant um a really brilliant platform for getting uh people from underrepresented groups into not just film and television but um literary theater anything creative and uh, they have a program called set access which i'm part of at the moment that's a constant sort of rolling mentorship program and um I think they're looking for more people so shout out if anyone wants to do it yeah I'll um, link, uh, I'll link the they um and they pair you they pair kind of anyone producers directors writers production coordinators anyone who's in the industry they pair you with a uh, a mentee and you do kind of monthly sessions where you focus on whatever the mentee wants to focus on and I've been working with my mentee a lot about um a lot on approaching people like cold approaching people and how to widen a network if you don't have one and where you start and I think like it's really scary for some people who don't um, necessarily, yeah, who don't necessarily feel com totally comfortable talking to strangers and who don't um, feel comfortable sending an email bigging themselves up because that's also what you have to do, isn't it? You have to like find a really delicate, non-arrogant way to say, hey, I'm wonderful, look at me, like look at my <laughs> CV instead of all the hundreds of other people that you've been, you know, yeah. approached by. And yeah, I think it's important. I think that that's one thing that, the industry should be more open to and I think it definitely is moving in that direction certainly here and I'm sure in the US as well but just being more open to people you know just getting in touch as you say it's yeah. easy to find email addresses online and stuff now you know we have our email addresses and mobile numbers on our website because it's the whole company approach is accessibility so um I it's really important that people can just pick up the phone and ring me and I'll have I'll have a if I have time I'll have a conversation with a stranger about like you know yeah. if they're interested in the film I mean within reason I'm not like having of course you know daily chats with total strangers about random yeah. things but I mean yeah, yeah. you know if, if somebody wants to pick up the phone and ask my opinion on something or ask for advice like you know they can and yeah. I think that that um needs to be a bit more of a, a thing that's cultivated because if you don't have any connections or you don't have you know of, yeah a dad who's worked in film or who whatever it's it's it can be really really difficult to get in or if you're not as you were saying lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time like I was and get you know get a chance to be a intern on a BBC set and then they're thereby intern on another show and you know thereby when I left university I'd done enough internships that I could actually get a paid job as a production assistant if you yeah, yeah if you don't have that luck and that luxury then um you know it's really hard and also well, financially the, it's really hard as well yeah financially it's it, we'll get to that but so what's the sort of <laughs> advice that you give to your mentee then on 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 in teaching someone how to do this right like how um, do you go about even teaching that I mean it's a really good question I'm learning as I go because <laughs> I, it's the first time I've been a mentor yeah and like it's still fine I still sort of find it funny that somebody thinks of me as a mentor but anyway um <laughs> the uh I, I think it's just about I I've just spent a lot of time like building their confidence and in themselves and in what they want to do and you know asking like questions like okay what are five things that you really like about yourself what are five things that you think you're really good at and and trying to then like weave those qualities into a cover letter and a covering email and sort of like focus on how to how to write the perfect cold email essentially and perfect cover letter because I think also it's really hard when you know uh if you're not someone who's naturally self-confident it's very difficult to you know you might think of it as bragging about yourself for right. example but you have to you have to reframe that and think no I'm just yeah. sharing what I value in myself with other people mm -hmm. um so that they can see the value in me but also wording that in an eloquent way is really difficult yeah I mean it's um, so, all yeah. just yeah it's all confidence building basically is the short yeah, answer and it's crazy right because it really is it's like if you feel confidence even if it's you know an inflated self a sense of self <laughs> it can be enough to kind of get you going I mean I know that when I was younger I definitely did not have the confidence but I projected it as such because I yeah, had right. some part fake of me make I, it. <laughs> right I mean but I think I think the fake it to you make it it can be misleading to younger people and that it means that you have to lie and it's not that you're lying it's just that some part of you knows that you have the know-how to figure it out or that mm -hmm. you can be in a place and watch and learn by by mm -hmm. seeing or by doing and then you just yeah. need to get access to that but yeah it's until you get opportunities to even be in those spaces yeah. that you know that but I remember when I was coming up like when I was a kid especially because you know I came to this country I didn't speak English I remember like even calling to order pizza like made me nervous mm -hmm. just the thought of speaking to a stranger on the phone mm -hmm. 
was mm. like incredibly nerve wracking. But the way I kind of trained myself is I would, when I would be in situations that were low stakes for me, for example, yeah. like if there was ever a Q and A, right. And I was in the audience, I would purposely put my hand up because it made me so nervous to get called on like in a right, classroom right, right. or in a Q&A oh, and I would have my hand up and I would be rehearsing the question in my head the whole time my heart rate would go up <laughs> and, and then I would forget the question you know it was like but I don't know why I would get that like nervous about it because I was so excited to actually be there mm. you know and in, in mm. whatever engaging in that whatever that thing was mm. but I just would get in my own head and so what I often tell people is like if you practice with lower stakes for you then when the bigger yeah. opportunities come it's not that you won't still feel anxiety or fear. You'll just have a little better way of navigating that within right. yourself in that moment of like, oh my God, I'm in an elevator with this person. Mm -hmm. I want to strike mm -hmm. up a conversation, but I don't want to be a total weirdo. How do I, <laughs> how do I make this? How do I come across like a normal human and not a robot? You know? Um, yeah. It's like, it really yeah. is baby steps that ultimately like cumulatively get you to a place where you can just call up somebody and it is such a learned skill. It's so interesting, but it, I think you're right. The root everyone of it really has comes that, down to confidence. There are yeah. some people like, you know, there's always going to be someone that you have that with, that I have that with, that you have that with. That feeling just never goes away. There's always someone yeah. who's intimidating. Yeah. But I think also one thing I always try and remember is that like, it's okay to take a breath and wait to answer. You don't have to jump straight in. You don't, you know, I even did it before this interview I was like thinking god I, don't, I hope I don't say anything stupid you know it's just it's fine to just take a beat and think about it you don't have to just jump straight in that's another thing I've said to my mentee about interviews you know you know count to count to three in your head if you like you know quickly but count to three in your head if you don't have the right answer and think about it or say like I'll come back to that later that's interesting I'll come back to that in, yeah. in a bit but um yeah I think so many people feel the need to fill a silence as well um yeah but yeah, definitely. The being in an elevator with somebody and being like, "Oh, I really wish I could say something." I was um, that happened to me actually once. I was in an elevator with Chris Hemsworth, and I was like, "I really want to say something, oh but you're God. too gorgeous. I can't say anything to you." What did you do? <laughs> did you say no. anything? You just stared at uh, him. No, uh, no. He actually said uh, he he was with his. Um, this is now a, a story I wasn't intending on telling, but he was with his personal <laughs> trainer, and we just both been in the same gym. Uh, uh, and he talked, uh, his trainer said something about how he'd saved my life because he'd stopped the lift doors from closing in my face. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then just sort of awkwardly looked down at my phone and didn't say anything <laughs> for the duration of the very awkward, long journey down. Oh my God. Elevator. I love that. Um, I had not a, not an elevator story, but a quick sidebar story. I once was, um, doing post, it was color correcting a, a documentary at this company here in Los Angeles. And it was at overnight. It was like, you know, they were donating these services to us. So the only time they could fit us in was like at midnight. So we park, it's like a rooftop park. And, you know, I going in, there's like these doors before you get to the elevator and I go to open the door and there's a man on the other side and we're both like, you know, playing tug of war with the door. And then the man like opens the door for me. And then I look up and it's Ryan Gosling and he's just like, <laughs> he's just like, and I just stared at him and he's like, are you going to come inside? And I was like, yes, uh -huh. yes, I am. I'm coming. I'm entering this building. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And it was just unexpected. It was so unexpected. And I think living in Los Angeles, I don't get very starstruck, but no. when you're so, and you're just like living your life and you're not in an environment mm. where you expect mm. to see someone that famous and then you bump into them, it's just like, it really catches you off guard. And there are yeah, certain yeah. people that just sparkle. They just have 100%. some aura about them. I don't know what it is. And Ryan Gosling is definitely one of those people. I, I was just, I, I was just like, uh, I couldn't speak. And the that's just another day really for weird thing. That's a really yeah. strange phenomenon that I don't understand where that comes yeah. from because it's absolutely true. I mean, there's, you know, there are certain people that just sparkle. And if you, you know, and if you meet, even if, if you meet them in real life, you're like, I don't understand. How do you have this sort of sort of, superhuman glow yeah. around you and it's not even it's about it's weird. not even about beauty necessarily there's just no. like something about their energy that you truly are just like drawn into them yeah you're just like yeah, you yeah. just want to stare at them you know and that's why <laughs> they're on screen because that's what they yeah do. so anyway that, there's that's, a few that's why they walk down the street like this because people are just going oh yeah like, i just want to go to the store and everybody's just like fainting and even imagine that like if every day of your life you just open a door to a building and there's going to be some woman on the other side just like 
like like just swooning you know yeah unintentionally I mean, the price was... the price you pay for being an actor i suppose but yeah, yeah i suppose i suppose but anyway now that we're done talking about how fancy we are as producers <laughs> sharing elevators <laughs> and meeting celebrities yeah i mean i mean that's definitely not the tone of this podcast in any stretch like we're fancy we share elevators with really famous attractive men well that's what people think we do so so for those exactly. listening yeah there are moments literal seconds of our lives where we intersect with famous people um if we're not working with them and that's it and then we go back into our Priuses and back into our you know studio apartments in Hollywood and send cold emails to people asking them to hire us back into our really unattractive trailers on set where everything's brown yeah (laughs) Yeah. that's right that's right okay such a digression that's my bad but very important I think the listeners will enjoy these fun tidbits so it's just fun Um, but I want to go back to so back to you so so then you start interning and then you freelance for a while before you kind of start to find your footing what would you say was the first experience you had where you were like oh wow this is I'm producing I'm a producer this is this is it like I'm doing the thing uh I I mean the first experience I I had an amazing opportunity given to me by a brilliant man called Michael Robinson who used to be uh, the CFO of Luke Rogue's company, Independent Sales, is a film sales agency here. And um, he left uh, Independent to start his own production company, which was uh, then then called MGR, and it's now Factor Six Films. And um, he, it was just him. He just left to start on his own, and he, he had worked on films like Mr. Nice, and we need to talk about Kevin, and um, mm, some really, that movie. you know, really really great independent films, and and. Um, and he gave me an opportunity. He he hired me as his assistant, his development assistant, basically. And he had an empty slate, and we helped, we developed his slate from the ground from nothing. Um, and it was, you know, he had no reason to take a chance on me. He was introduced to me by a, a casting director called Debbie McWilliams, who, again, I met through a friend, and it was just all that kind of like connections, networking situation as this business always is. Um, and and he wasn't even going to hire an assistant and we met and we got along really well. And then he sort of said, okay, you know, come in and, and be my assistant. And it was a really um, amazing. I worked for him for a year and that was an amazing experience because he had come from sales and finance and he really like taught me how, you know, a recruitment schedule works and how film sales works and how independent financing works and, um, and, and all that stuff that is so useful now and is actually quite complicated to learn or can be complicated to learn. And he just made it so simple um, and was so like, you know, giving with his time and energy and and um, and also, you know, would bring me into meetings with writers and filmmakers and, you know, wanted my opinion on everything. I read everything, we did everything together. And it was that, like, yeah, he was a, a wonderful person to work with. And he's now actually exec producing one of our films, which is great. So the relationship Amazing. has continued, yeah. but he, um, you know, he was one of those people that I think uh, it, he gave me a lot of responsibility and he trusted me a lot and and he had no reason to because it was, you know, my first proper job out of university and he, you know, he didn't know me from Adam, but it was, um, yeah, that I think, you know, so much of this job is learning by osmosis and, you know, yeah. learning by watching pe- other people do what they're doing, other more experienced people. And, and you know, he you know, I brought a book to him that I wanted to option and, and that I'd been really passionate about. And he read it and he said, great, well, we'll option it together. And, you know, you can run the show and I'll just oversee it. And I was like, this is mad. Why are you, you know, <laughs> why? And it was just having that. It's so amazing when you have those people that have that faith in you and that trust in you. And, and yeah. um, you know, so that was the real, probably the really the first job that I had that was like, you know, this is, this is something that I definitely want to do. And I, I, you know, I knew I wanted to do it before that and I knew I loved it. And, um, but that was the kind of cementing thing. Um, and then I left him after a year and I went to work for 42 for Ben Pugh and Rory Aitken, um, who run the production side of the management and production company. Um, and that was a, you know, incredible baptism of fire because they had, they were about a year <laughs> into the company when I joined and it was sort of all hands on deck. The team was quite small and they're now, massive so they've done s- s- such incredible work in the last what, eight or nine years I think it's been since mm. they've been going um and you know I was assistant to Ben and Rory and then also you know working for the head of television who just, just started Eleanor Moran at the time and then kind of you know doing production coordinating on some of the films and 
post like helping the post supervisor on four films and and you know and also kind of trying to keep on top of their development slate and everything and it so it was just a little bit of everything and um yeah and I you know I learned a huge amount and I met my now business partner George Monklin there because she was one of the agents well one of the managers sorry I should say on the management side um and we became firm friends and now like years later here we are running a company together so I think definitely a firm believer in you know everything happens for a reason and you you know you do yeah you get pulled into things unexpectedly and there's always a positive that comes out of everything and um and I that that was an amazing company to work for and you know obviously George and I both loved working there because we've pretty much founded our own management and production company in their mirror image so um yeah. uh yeah and I mean I so, think that was that I was there for like about three and just over three, maybe three years I was there um and I left there to go and work for Yorgos Lanthimos which I was offered a job on his film The Favourite and mm. helping rap post on Killing of a Sacred Deer and I loved him as a filmmaker obviously I mean who doesn't yeah. but he's, um, <laughs> um yeah I got that phone call to go and meet him and I was like um I remember turning to Ben who I'd told and said I was going to leave because there wasn't any sort of upward progression available at the time at 42 mm. and I sort of felt like I'd reached the end of my um you know, uh, like, uh, you know, Your growing time, out yeah. of the role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, growing mm-hmm. out of the role. Sorry, I was just struggling for the words. But, um, <laughs> and I, you know, I said to Ben, I've been offered to go and meet Yorgos. And Ben was like, go. If I'd been, you know, go now. If I'd been offered that opportunity, at, you know, at your stage, at your age, I would have just leapt at it. So done. Yeah. Um, they were always so supportive. And um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. No, uh, it's all good. I'm not used to talking so much. Uh, <laughs> and, um, I can cut stuff out too, by the way, so you can take a, a moment and continue. Okay. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's maybe cut chill. the cough out. <laughs> well, I'll keep so, it in. I'll keep it real. I don't know. We'll see how I feel. Yeah, we'll just, see how you feel. It's fine. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I went to work with Yorgos on the favorite, and you know, had an incredible time because obviously he's an incredible filmmaker and. Um, it was an amazing film to work on just one of those one of those experiences where everyone was you know it was just a joyous set you know and I think I think made that way partly by the fact that you know Olivia Coleman and Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz and all the cast were so wonderful and you know Olivia would walk onto set and say hello to everybody by name like grips gaffers everybody like she knew everyone and I think like that just cultivates such a yeah. great atmosphere well, especially when you know these people are all slaving away and working to make you look good and it just shows the kind of yes. brilliant person she is that she had yes, made yes, so yes. much effort to get to know everyone and um and that was just yeah it was so much fun and Yorgos is like sort of very playful almost theatrical way of directing the actors is just such an incredible thing to watch and um you know seeing him rehearse with them and everything was just yeah it was such a, a, a joyous thing and such an insight um into how he into how he functions yeah. and and um yeah that was just an incredible experience and then um went on to teen spirit just directly off the back of that with fred berger yeah um who yeah who called who just called me and said i need a i need a producer to help in in london with max's film do you want to was that his directorial film? debut max's debut yeah it was his directorial was, okay. debut yeah 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 okay. so he'd written the script with um jamie bell and who exec produced it and and then Max directed and Fred produced Fred and Brian Cameron Jones at Automatic produced it. Yeah, and, um, yeah, yeah. and yeah, and they just needed a sort of like on the ground helping hand. And again, another person who, um, you know, much like Michael, much like Ben, who trusted me, you know, implicitly when they didn't really need to, but just gave me a lot of responsibility and um, it gave me the opportunity to, to sort of, flex my muscles feels like a weird thing to say you know like you know like um yeah just gave me the opportunity to 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 experience things and to do things and to learn from them and watch them and and you know um I learned so much from being on set with both Ben and with Fred and like they're such brilliant producers and I think like watching watching them doing what they do and one thing I always admired so much about Ben is the fact that he um he's always so calm 
you know, regardless mm. of if, if there's something really drastic and horrible going wrong, he's just so calm and still and he doesn't let anything, it does, he doesn't look like he's riled at all. And that's one thing I've always tried to like emulate Harness. in, yeah, in, yeah. in, in, in how I way. work. It's like that <laughs> that crazy kind of, you know, duck, duck legs underwater, like paddling like mad. And then on yes. the surface, you're just super chilled <laughs> because the second you start losing your mind, everyone else freaks oh, out. Yeah, it's bad. I mean, I've been on those sets where the producer in charge was like throwing things things and it's just oh, to your God. point like you I, I I say this a lot on the show but I do very strongly believe this after most of my experience being in physical production that mm. I don't know how you cultivate a safe workplace and a, a place for creativity to blossom if you're running your set based on fear or based on like a negative emotion yet yeah. you know obviously many many things have been many stories have been told many great movies have been told without that and then you go and yeah. you read about it and they say the conditions were horrible everybody was fighting behind the scenes but it looked like an incredible project but nowadays yeah. I think this there's a shift of like really creating a workplace that in this conversation of inclusivity and diversity and really creating a space for for that to blossom I, I think mm -hmm. it's it's night and day honestly it really is yeah. um and I think people just naturally then go that extra mile for you because they just feel mm -hmm. like they really are a part of a community and they want to you yeah. know just work harder mm -hmm. um so it's it's a win-win all around yeah it's also you know people always say you know the best directors are those people who've been worked in various different departments and understand yeah. all of the crew I think the best producers are the same you know like if you've if you know you have to understand what everybody else is doing so that you yeah. can understand why they might be stressed or why something might go wrong for them and and you know that's part of the reason I wanted to go and work for Yorgos was because I'd never really spent much time on like oh a full film shoot on a film set yeah. before I did the favorite and, and, what, and what was what was your biggest takeaway at that time after that experience with him um, oh god aside from just how you know brilliant he is brilliant as a filmmaker, was, but yeah. in terms of yeah, <laughs> aside yeah. From how amazing he is um I think just I get I mean just again cultivating that atmosphere that 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 kind of warm friendly environment and you know, always making everybody feel respected and 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 important, regardless yeah. of if they're the they're the runner, they're the caterers, they're the DOP, whoever it is. Just like making sure that everybody feels like they know that without, you know, without their cog in the machine, the machine wouldn't be functioning. Because yeah, it, yeah, yeah. and it is that that familial environment. You know, you become family with these people because you don't see your own family for six to nine months or however long it is that you're working on something, and yeah. it's so intense. And I think that's you know um that's why often it's a really brilliant experience but I'm sure why often for some in some instances it can be a very stressful experience if there's a negative environment that you're in and you're just stuck there mm -hmm. um I'm sure that's really horrible I thankfully haven't experienced it thus I, yet. I've, I've had a few oh, of those <laughs> are very rough it's rough but yeah. I do think it makes you cherish the ones that are great even more so and for me anyway yeah. it really solidified in my journey like I'm never going to be like that. And the moment yeah. I have become that way, I'm I'm not going to do this anymore because yeah. it's no longer fun and I'm not showing up as my yeah. best self and I'm not going to be a good leader or effective. And yeah. what's the point? Like just join corporate America. It's definitely easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I mean, that's the thing you don't do. You don't do this career. You don't, you don't work in this industry because, you know, you can earn a quick buck or it's easy to get into or it's easy to progress in you know you do it because it's a vocation and you couldn't imagine doing anything else that like you you know yeah. so I think if 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 it if it stops being enjoyable it stops being fun stop yes of course you have to work hard and you have to you know learn things and you have to challenge yourself and face up to challenges that you're set but but if you're not enjoying it and you're not working with like-minded good people at the end of the day there's no point in doing it because right. also you know you're making you're making movies it's not open heart surgery it's right. meant to be fun <laughs> you yes, know exactly um, um yeah well and, and, and was, speaking of working yeah with good people um i didn't mean to cut you off if you were gonna say no no no, not at all I, else. I was can't, just can't remember <laughs> you could cut, I was cut, that cut that out cut that out um so in speaking of talking you uh, know i can't speak there you go <laughs> and speaking of, of working with good people, I'd love to talk a little bit about Peach House and how that came to be yeah. and working with George Please. and 
and um, all of that. So tell us how that came to fruition because you were very honest with me earlier about not really wanting to be a lit manager and how that <laughs> was something that you didn't really think Don't you tell wanted to do or enjoy, <laughs> but you do. Here's the plot twist, clients and listeners. She does. She loves it. But <laughs> she tell loves us. it. <laughs> um, yeah, I no, I didn't. I really didn't. I mean, I yeah. So I I. I came, so Peach House came about because I had so off the back of Teen Spirit, I started Peach Pictures as a production company purely initially just to uh, to be able to apply to the BFI for development finance for a film with this brilliant filmmaker, Laura Kirwan Ashman, um, whose feature first feature film I'm producing uh, called Lit. And we, um, you know, I, I, I love the film. I met her and I, you know, I, I took it under a sh with a shopping option from her agents at 42 actually. And, um, and said, you know, I'll set it up with some development finances and we got it in with the BFI. And then, you know, that was the reason I started the company. And then off the back of that, I was, you know, I started finding some other young filmmakers that I wanted to work with and developing a slate and then ended up kind of meeting um Stephen Garrett who um runs a company called Character 7 and it just produced The Undoing and mm. was exact produced The Undoing I should say and um uh and you know we ended up developing starting to develop a television show together and so this slate kind of like naturally grew and I was kind of thinking well if people want to work with me like maybe I should just try this and see if I can do it you know I'm young enough hopefully that if it goes tits up I can do something else <laughs> afterwards um and so I was producing commercials and music videos on the side to try and you know keep food on the table because obviously producers get nothing in development so that's right, um, that's right. and as we all know and um yep. and was kind of trying to do that but then obviously trying to develop a slate of projects and actually give my time and energy to them whilst also having to like produce branded content music videos commercials which are obviously you know baby films but just so fast paced and such a quick turnaround and actually takes so much energy for three weeks to a month of your life that, right. that that month you know none of the films are getting any attention because Nothing you're working done. on a car yeah. advert or whatever it is yeah you know? yeah and um and so I found that really really difficult and and you know I ended up taking a full-time in-house assisting job at a comfort at a production company um, which wasn't something I really wanted to do because I felt like it was a step back, but I just needed some sort of solid income. And I thought, you know, doing a, a more junior level job, that's something I've done before for years. And like, I can, I can do this and then easily, and then I can do, keep my slate going on the side. And they were very flexible about me having this, you know, company and running it. And, um, but anyway, obviously that didn't work out either because as everybody who's been an assistant knows, it's crazy and full on. And, um, so yeah, so I ended up, uh leaving there and um and just you know keeping going with the commercials and everything and just uh, as sort of doing as few as I could and just living off the money that I had and, and trying to keep get the projects going and uh thankfully at that time um you know I always this comes back to the point of that everything happens for a reason because if I hadn't have taken that assistant job I wouldn't have been at Toronto Film Festival where Teen Spirit, Spirit was premiering and I wouldn't have got to um, meet with again and hang out and spend time with Sarah Curran and Peter Sussman who are now the backers of Peach House and the reason that Peach House exists so um, you know every yeah everything happens for a reason and yeah. Sarah was an amazing woman um, you know she's she's yeah incredible she ran her own production legal firm for years um, and uh, you know she was the MD of James Grant and she she you know has been a consultant for everyone I mean MGM and used to work at working title and um I'm probably missing heaps of her credits but she's <laughs> she's um, she's an incredible woman and a very um important part of Peach House and she started a company called Tricycle Media and Tricycle Talent and invests in both management companies and across all different creative industries so they have a, a literary agency and um a uh, sports agency and football agency and um and you know us and a voiceover agency and and you know and all of we're all a sort of very happy family and everybody within tricycle are all wonderful and so we're encouraged to kind of cross pollinate and help each other where we can which is a really lovely um atmosphere and lovely thing to be a part of and sarah um yeah sarah's whole ethos is kind of like taking you know helping people that she believes in and and giving them a little bit of startup money to to, mm -hmm. to set something up on their own and then she's she chairs each company she's the chairman of Peach House and an incredible advisor and 
um you know Amazing. we we rely on her for so many different things because she she just knows everybody and has like such incredible insight from her experience um and she uh I was in Los Angeles before Toronto Film Festival and she sent me a really lovely message on uh Instagram and said oh I see you're in LA do you want to get a drink and I'd you know I didn't know anyone in LA apart from people I was working with so it was very nice to be, very nice to be contacted and invited for a drink and um and I hadn't really seen we we crossed paths a little bit on the favorite because she put the financing and casting together for that film um and uh but we but had only really known each other properly of when I was at 42 and um and she was working with 42 on a couple of their different productions at the time and so uh yeah we met and had a drink and she was so lovely and took loads of interest in what I was doing in the peach picture slate and I showed yeah. her our like a deck of projects and um and then she introduced me to Peter and um and you know uh we ended up I ended up having dinner with them in Toronto and continued to the conversation and then came back to London and she just would check in with me and see how I was doing and was very like kindly helping me trying to raise some development money for the company and kind of said look it can't be something that tricycle would come on board because it we're investing in management companies not in production companies and um I introduced her to George who was had set up on her own um after taking a year off and um and I thought could really benefit with the support because she was obviously setting up a new management company on your own is pretty hard yeah um and so Sarah Sarah was the one who said to George and I well this is mad I mean why don't you two partner up because you're really good friends you've worked together for years and if you partner then I can invest in both of you and back both of you amazing um <laughs> so uh so yeah so we sort of thought well that seems like a really good idea I'm not sure why we didn't think of that ourselves um I and I guess Sarah sort of Sarah and George was were saying to me like look we've got we've got talent we've got the actors you've got the production slate we should bridge the gap and you should represent writers and directors and um and I initially as you rightly said was a little bit like reticent to to do that and and didn't know if it was something I would like or I was good at or if it would detract from the producing side of it and you know and Sarah really encouraged me and said well you know you're working with all these early stage first second time filmmakers that you, some of whom I was kind of finding and introducing them to other agents that I knew because mm -hmm. they weren't represented or introducing them around to other production companies and kind of bigging them up and essentially doing some of the job of what being their agent or manager would actually be and you know just not capitalizing on it so it seemed like a it seemed like a good idea absolutely from a sort of financial perspective but in terms of me doing it I, I just was unsure if I would really enjoy it that much to be totally honest and I'd always yeah. thought producing is the thing for me that's what I want to do I want to be on set I want to be making films I want to be you know developing shows and um and actually like you know I love it because I get to the whole kind of the whole USP of the company is working with young up and up and coming talent and finding young up and coming talent supporting them from you know from the ground up some of my clients have made like one short film but I just really believe in them and it would know with the right amount of kind of support yeah. they'll get where they want to go and and that was always what we wanted to do we wanted to make this kind of bespoke great hands-on company that really tailors their approach to each person and and really creatively guides them and and you know and doesn't force them into anything that they don't want to do but you know hopefully advises them appropriately and 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 I think the but yeah be really hands-on and I think I guess coming from a producing point of view or coming from a development point of view that's an interesting thing about having me as a manager because I'm coming at their work from two different perspectives I'm coming at right. it from I'm thinking okay if I'm a produ producer at this production company that I'm I get sent this script what am I going to think about it and so I guess it it gives um yeah I guess it, it means that when we send their work out to people there's an element of strategy behind it and it's been really thought yeah. through it's two um, for the price of one potentially yeah one could say certainly feels like it sometimes <laughs> <laughs> well because there's a lot of in the states there's a lot of managers who don't like to produce their clients work they have no interest um yeah they hate producing and then there are some managers who are you know, very instrumental in getting those projects yeah. set up. And once it's greenlit and you go into production, yeah. I've been on a series of projects where the manager then becomes a producer and, you know, kind of mm -hmm. visits set here and there, but not, isn't running point on production, but is very closely involved. And it has raised this question of like, 
managers who then become producers and get the producer mm -hmm. title is mm -hmm. that this is that fair because then there's you know the producers who are doing the physical work of making the movie but yeah. one could argue that without that manager you would not have gotten the mm -hmm. movie to be greenlit in the first place so mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm curious if if there's similarities with how it works in the uk or generally how it all kind of comes together i mean i think obviously it's slightly um slightly different for us in terms of you know I'm doing the job of manager and agent, you know, and lawyer, uh, mm. because, you know, I do all the clients contracts, I negotiate their deals, I pitch them out for work and jobs and solicitate solicit work for them, but also kind of creatively guide them as well. So it's every all, yeah, all, all jobs. So there's for the no price delineation there. Cause like here, obviously there's a big d d differentiation between agents are allowed to negotiate the on behalf and managers yeah. are not. And then half yeah. the time agents have very base, baseline understanding of le mm -hmm. legal but then there's you know obviously you have a lawyer on your team as well so there's yeah. effectively three people but so it yeah. sounds like in the UK there's no, there's no oh interesting there's no delineation I think you know with um so no I mean I think you know like certainly you would only have one person here if you were managed by Peach House you wouldn't then be represented by Independent or Curtis Brown or United or any of the other agencies if you same thing if you were managed by 42 you wouldn't be represented by any of the other agencies right, and right, I think right. the um yeah so there's no delineation in terms of of that and obviously at the bigger companies they have in-house business affairs and we're much right. smaller so I tend to do it myself and like I said before love negotiating so hmm. it's uh I, what do you, I, I relish I relish that bit <laughs> what do you love about it what do you love about negotiating um, no, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, maybe saying you love negotiating is actually not the best because it maybe comes across <laughs> as I like to argue with people. But no, it, I don't think, I don't, like that. that's I think, not what I interpret when you say that, but I'm curious I what think your it, answer is. I think it's just the, I think it's just using that side of my brain. I enjoy, you know, yeah. using the kind of strategic side of my brain and thinking, how can I get the best for the client out of this? And also I think that's interesting coming from a, producing point of view because if the producer I'm negotiating with I, I'm thinking I can think in their brain and in my brain you know like I might know that what they're asking for is completely fair but obviously I have to push back because I'm representing the client but in, in my head if I was doing the deal and I was them I would be asking for the same thing so I think right. it gives a good a good balance but I think uh you know it's just it's just a I don't know what I don't know what it is I, I just think I like lose, using that side of my brain I enjoy yeah. kind of you know the yeah reading uh reading contracts it's a weird thing to say you enjoy but there you go <laughs> hey it is not weird at all we need people who enjoy that that's really important and i'm sure your clients um, who hopefully will be listening will be glad to hear that you enjoy doing fingers, that part fingers crossed. i mean yeah, I, yeah. I think that's important because it's the non-sexy parts of the underbelly right. of just the nitty-gritty day-to-day stuff that is mm -hmm. very much a big part of producing as well like business affairs legal yeah. I was actually talking to another producer friend just yesterday that she was saying when she was in school that was her favorite class because she's like where yeah. else am I going to learn this and most of us yeah. have to learn just because you're in the trenches and now you have yeah. to learn how to read a contract and you figure it out but mm -hmm. if you can go into it already enjoying it I think that speaks volumes Do you know what I and, and yeah go ahead Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I think um, no, I just thought of a I thought of a far better answer to that question okay. than I had before. I think it's because there's a there's a there's a sort of a clear answer. It's one of the only bits of of the job that is you know, it's it's logical and it's it's almost a bit more like mathematical. You know, there's a there's mm. a clear answer. You know, there are specific clauses that you know you can get through, and and it, and it's sort of like you know what to ask for and what you're going what you can really achieve and in terms of financial negotiating as well that's like you you know you know what is appropriate or what's wga appropriate or wggb appropriate or whatever for a writer or um and i think you know that i guess it's 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 kind of the like cleanness of it in a way because everything mm -hmm. else is a little bit subjective i mean this is still subjective i suppose sorry i'm talking myself around in circles but it's i think it's just it's um, it's interesting it's, i mean because it, i think it's an important thing to talk about because a lot of people fear negotiating women especially right it's yeah. notoriously women don't know how to self-advocate <sighs> so especially when it yeah. comes to when you're starting out and negotiating for yourself even if it's your your pa and you've maybe been doing it for a long time and you just want to ask for an extra mm -hmm. dollar an hour um the fear yeah. that people have with that so 
I, I think what you're yeah. saying is important. And if you have any tidbits for those who are like just sort of, sort of trying to sink their teeth into getting mm. uh, understanding this part of the process, like mm. maybe they too can find something about it that is something to be excited about of the challenge yeah. of the puzzle of the equation versus like mm. this fear of whatever mm. they create in their minds, you know, about it. Yeah, I think, um, I suppose, I guess my advice would be in, yeah, I mean, I always just ask questions if I don't understand something. And I think look, so, so many people fear asking questions because they think it makes them look weak. Whereas in actual fact, I think it makes you look stronger if you're just, you know, confident enough to say, I haven't, haven't got a clue what this means, please tell me. Or I, I don't understand the wording here. Can you explain in, in more detail, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I also try to always like minimize the redlining, something that Sarah taught me because sending back a document that's just covered in red line is always really intimidating and it's all right it's yeah, gonna yeah. get somebody off on a bad foot immediately <laughs> um and and I think just you know I guess I think of it as more of a challenge I make it fun because I think of it as like you know if I can get here then I've won you know in a way yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. it sounds silly but it's kind of like thinking of it as thinking of it as a fun challenge as opposed to mm. something to be intimidated by um, I think I always try and go into this and also like you always have to get to yes like my goal is always to get to a yes or get to an agreement I don't want to right. I don't want to stall something I don't want to I don't want to get in the way of closing a deal and I certainly don't want to make the producer who whose position I have been in at one point or another have a terrible time I yeah. want to get the best for my client but equally I want them to um, you know, equally, I want to close the deal as quickly and efficiently and painlessly as possible, because I think sometimes people drag that stuff out for months and months. And you're like, come on, it's really not that hard. And you, and I think it's just that comes back to the producing thing, because I think so much about so much of producing and managing is about reading people. And, you know, you can read, you can really tell when someone is like, they're drawing their bottom line, and they're saying, you know, you can't go any higher, or like, this is really a no. And it, that's right, just right, right. gut instinct, isn't it? But I think you, those, it's normally quite clear to me when I've like, I've gone, I've gone as far as I'm going to be able to take it. And then you just have to kind of accept where you've taken it to. Um, yeah. Because you don't want to push yeah. it into like a sour place. That yeah, kind of absolutely. And, and also I think too, it's important that it, it is a small business, right? And so you circle the same people often and I know for yeah. example like I've been a part of absolutely not I wasn't the producer running point on this but with deals with certain lawyers with certain actors mm -hmm. like four years ago when I was like a nobody mm -hmm. or whatever and now I have a sour taste in my mouth for that lawyer because of that experience you know and, and right. maybe that was just whatever the circumstances but it just exactly. you really get to kind of see uh you get to really understand it in a different way mm. and, and it sticks with you. Mm. And yeah, and like people move around and then in private people will, will all be very honest about how they feel about mm. certain people in the business. And you just kind of go, yeah. Oh, okay. This is this kind of lawyer who does this or, you know, and, and sometimes I wonder, do their clients know that that's how they mm. are dealing on their behalf? Because it, I find it gets a little misrepresentative sometimes of certain mm. people who are very nice, but perhaps that's what they need. You know, someone who's going to blow it but up I for them. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's interesting, because I think so many so often. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can. I think it's just about being polite and respectful and kind, isn't it? I mean, as as is with everything, obviously, that yeah. you know, seems like a very simplistic thing to say, but actually, so many people forget it often that it's, you know, ultimately, so long as you're being polite and respectful, and, um, you know, kind to the person you're dealing with, you know, it's a biz it's a business negotiation at the end of the day and it's a business. Yeah. So like pushing back and saying, actually, we want this, so long as you're saying it in a respectful way, right. It shouldn't really leave any negative taste in somebody's mouth because you're just doing your job and you're protecting yeah. your client. But it's yeah. just when I think when it when it takes ages and people get fed up and they just want to close it because they want to move forward, like I always try and respond to contracts and things really as efficiently as possible and, you know, go back within a couple of days because it, it yeah. just, otherwise it gets like, you know, it, it just gets frustrating. And then having been on the other side of it myself as a producer waiting for agents to send contracts back, you're like, come on, I just want to, I want to get moving with the thing. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just want to be mindful of time. Are you okay? Because we already hit the hour yeah. and I just have a few more questions. I just want to make sure you weren't like, no, 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 or anything. No, um, no, no, not at all. I'm fine. Okay, good. Well, we do have a few questions before we wrap up. Um, 
the so I want to switch gears for a bit because so much of the mm-hmm. show I personally really love to talk about because I'm a martyr perhaps or a masochist I don't know <laughs> but I I love um, discussing the realities and the challenges of the ups and downs of our business and particularly for your own journey and how you've navigated mm-hmm. that for yourself mm-hmm. and as we talked about sort of at the top of this you know is sometimes it's daily or weekly that there's these existen- mm-hmm. existential crises within ourselves but but um. I always I like to ask this question because as someone who freelanced like for so long and even mm-hmm. till this day, I think there's this projection and the, the, the image that people see when they think of anyone who they deem successful that we don't have, you know, the, the struggle, that we don't feel all of the things. And, and as someone who struggles on and off with all of the things, you know, and, and still mm-hmm. feels sometimes like, am I enough? Am I doing enough? Is this ever enough? Mm-hmm. Is anything enough? What is the point of it all? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I, I, I like to basically know how others navigate that for themselves, because it's been mm-hmm. such a journey for me of almost 15 years of being mm-hmm. seeped in this business and having pockets of it where my self-worth was really tied to my producing yeah. identity right and like what I was yeah. doing and the kinds of projects I was getting and am I always leveling up or am I sort of like laterally moving every time mm-hmm. and of course mm-hmm. that's still there because we're hungry we want to do the next thing yeah. but um yeah. but yeah I'm just curious like how you've navigated that and if there's been any particular challenge that you know you've you've overcome um God, I'm sure. I'm sure heaps of them. Um, I probably <laughs> well, can't even one think is of an them. Example. That, yeah, is um, an example that I you think want to share. But I think it's just. Um, I mean, yeah, navigating self worth is is really hard, and and um, I think I think you just have to be kind to yourself as well in this business because mm. you know, like, so, I mean it's sort of, you know, 90% of the time you need to expect that you're going to, you know, you're going to be disappointed. Like when you go out to an actor for a film, they're probably going to say no. And the financiers are probably going to say no for something, you know, and it's, it's just that, but that 10% is so gratifying and so great (laughs) that it's worth, it's worth keeping going for. And I think, um, you know, and, and that's right. It's just, you just have to be, you just have to, I guess be com- comfortable in your own skin. I think that's certainly something that I found mm. took a long time to get there for yeah. me because, you know, I again like especially when you're assisting um, producers and and, and that it can be really hard and it can be like because it's so demanding and you know if you're not doing it there are a thousand other people queuing up that will take the job if you're not right. doing it well enough and that yeah. kind of pressure is is really really stressful and you know like I, and. You know, I think I remember at 42 when I was working on a film, I think I was tired and I, I'd messed something up in like the end roller of a film. And it meant that they had to open up the DCP and, you know, redo the credits. And that was probably going to cost a, a, a whack. And it was completely my fault. And and I remember Ben saying to me, you know, um, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's not like it's, you know, I'm the producer. It's my responsibility. And I felt so terrible. And, and I always thought... Um, you know, I always thought highly of him anyway, but I thought even more highly of him after that because it's like that's, and and I learned that then, you know, that as the producer, you have to take responsibility. You know, you're the senior person, like anything is your fault, even if it's not something you've directly done, essentially. Yeah. Um, and you're you're taking all the risk and taking all the responsibility. And, but that's like, you know, you're, you're, I mean, you're caring for everybody in your crew and you're caring for everybody yeah. in your company and everything. And I think like, that um you know so I'm, I'm sure there are loads more things that I could give an example of times I've really <laughs> messed up and then been really stressed and worried about it but that was one that I just remembered um but I think I think in terms of self-care and looking after yourself it's really important to take time for yourself you know I I mean I say this but obviously it's hard it's easier said than done you know I, I try not to look at my phone after a certain time in the evening but then if you're actually working on a film or something that's nigh on impossible you know I try and make sure I um you know try and make sure I exercise and have some time for myself and take a bath if I really want one or not beat myself up if I have an afternoon where actually I'm not feeling that productive so I'm gonna 
you know, take a break and read a script or take a break. Well, that's still work, isn't it? But take a break. And, <laughs> and that's every like, producer. We, like, I'm, I'm going to take time. <laughs> I'm downtime. I'm just script. lightly yeah. reading three scripts and giving notes and watching a cut of this. I know. <laughs> so it's so hilarious. I always find I get I get to the weekend. I'm like, God, my reading list is so long because the clients have delivered material, which is brilliant. Obviously, keep delivering, guys. But, the, um, <laughs> but like, you know, or, or I've got people that have requested representation and sent me things I'm like oh just you know spend the afternoon on Saturday reading some stuff and then you realize like the whole day is gone and you've just been basically working all day but I'm like it's fine it's fun it's the fun bit of the job yeah I mean that's but the I, thing. Think I think taking so much time for it, yourself yeah it's so much of it is doesn't feel like work a lot of the times like the fun yeah. parts of it that I think it's easy to just do it nonstop, nonstop. But yeah, I think yeah. more importantly, like, what is it that fills your energetic, spiritual well, right? So that you mm. can show up and mm. be all all that you can and need to be for yourself and for your clients to have the stamina mm. to keep it going. So what is that for you that kind of um, when you're down, then you need to fill up? Uh, food, um cooking food relax mm. like I find cooking really therapeutic and relaxing and yeah uh my partner and I are obsessed with master chef so we watch it <laughs> every time it's like you know religiously um and try and come up with our own signature dishes and uh <laughs> probably not as good as the ones on master chef but um hey, at least you're doing it but but yeah I think food I think you know just um spending time with my friends you know obviously hard in the pandemic but into just going for a walk with my you know I'm really lucky yeah. my best friend lives down the road and you know we can go for a walk together or going for a walk with George and even if we're talking about work just like getting out in the fresh air and you know just um yeah just having a chat and and switching off from from what you're doing but I find I find at the moment it's really difficult I'm sure everyone's the same because yeah. you spend so much time on on your phone on or on zoom on screen that then the prospect of facetiming or calling your friend in the evening is that which would be an enjoyable thing is just exhausting because it's just another yeah. call and I, that sounds so bad but you know no I, think I, that, I feel that like I I told it's really I very regularly speak to my parents and we do facetime and, and I just my right. mom sometimes will call me at the end of the work day and I'm like I'm sorry I just can't I just can't yeah just can't exactly like I just don't want to have any energy present and enjoy it I just I'm depleted and like I just can there's no more output of energy left today let's try again tomorrow (laughs) check back in you know the weird thing is that in normal life I mean you know if we were in the office I'd be like probably meeting clients for a drink after work or I'd be going out with a friend or going to a movie or whatever and maybe have you know plans most nights of the week or at least several nights during the week and somehow still have the energy to get up and do it again the following day and I think it's there yeah it's that we are not really getting that energetic exchange by physically being with people Uh, another producer friend a different producer friend we were talking about how in real life when you finish a conversation there's still things that happen after that conversation like if you and I were meeting right now we would finish this conversation I would walk you to your car we would see something like it would just be a natural evolution of a thing and with the zoom it's like and we're done and we're out and that's it and there's like this cut you know there's like a cut very like yeah. s- very sort of severe cut and you don't get to like kind of climb into the thing and then finish out the, the experience mm-hmm. and you don't have that physical like all I have of you is a frame I don't know mm-hmm. what's going on with the rest of your body language I can't see that I can only see what you're yeah. showing me so I think it it creates this we're connected but we're not really getting to have that connection mm-hmm. and I think when you are physically in the presence of someone whose company you mm-hmm. enjoy it it and it like infuses you with more energy and yeah, I think that's why definitely. these zooms as enjoyable as it can be ultimately are depleting because you're sitting here this whole time and you're just kind of like yeah. sinking into your chair <laughs> time, and time yeah, I, know. You know? So um, I keep so. sort of putting my shoulders back being like must sit up straight yeah. and we'll have a go at me <laughs> yeah I don't know there's just there's just something about it so I, I th- there is a whole like room f- zoom fatigue and all of that there's mm. a big psychological component to it that I think is very mm. real so yes to your mm. point um, I think on the other side of pandemic it'll be a lot easier but in the yeah. meantime like you know doing the best you can with within the resources of what you have and it sounds like you are yeah. so that's great yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I think also just the, the important thing I always try and remind myself and remind friends and colleagues and people who have similar situations especially at the moment is just like be kind to yourself if you feel unproductive or you feel like you're not having a good day or just you know take a break take an hour off go for a walk 
sit in the sun if there is sun um there was today in london for the first time wow, um good. you know um <laughs> or you know yeah i'll have a bath or go like work out or whatever yeah. it is just just do something else to to and you know you don't i think the problem with the whole being at home the whole time is like you you get to after dinner and you think oh god i forgot that email I'm, i'll just send it quickly now so you just never really have the time to switch off you know i i was talking to a very dear producer friend the other day who said she went into the office for the first time and as long as she can remember for the day came home and actually didn't look at her phone and you know had a pizza and watched like six episodes of the flight attendant back to back and didn't think about work like you know and and, and just was like what an enjoyable evening and I haven't looked at my phone for you know how many hours yeah. and then went to sleep woke up the following day and actually felt refreshed whereas she didn't you know because it's very, just so hard to switch yeah. off yeah yeah you're just plugged um, in the whole time yeah absolutely especially you know I'm in my kitchen right now like I'm gonna end this call and like just literally walk two meters over there to go and cook dinner and it's you know <laughs> it's like there's no there's no separation yeah it's hard yeah it's hard um, I agree I agree but they're doing this thing I don't know because I thought it'd be fun this like lightning round where it's just five quick questions to kind of wrap it up. Um, mm -hmm. And so just whatever comes to mind and you can pause and you don't have to be fast in your response, but <laughs> so the first song is the first question. So the first question is what's a song that teleports you to a happy place? Ooh, um, well, that's a really good question. Dancing in the moonlight by Thin Lizzy. Nice. What latest piece of art that moved you? It could be a film, a book, a show, et cetera. Uh, at least people are that moved me. I recently watched The Leftovers uh, in full, which I hadn't seen before. Um, and I just thought it was absolutely genius. I thought it was really, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just thought it was really like amazing to see genuine real people just being sad and angry at the world and what life had served them. Um, and it, yeah, it just felt so real. And the final episode was really moving. And I watched that recently. So. That. what is oh so fill in the blank when I'm overworked blank helps ease the stress Ooh. uh <laughs> wine <laughs> um Perfect. no when I'm overworked what helps ease the stress uh aside from wine um hmm. well it's just blank it could be anything it's whatever uh when I'm overworked um it was a really long answer sorry <laughs> not quick fire at all <laughs> no I'm gonna um, get better at these myself <laughs> yeah you can you can you can trim around this I'll do it again I'll say the whole question again um do you want me to just repeat it I'll just repeat it and you can okay. just answer it okay. it's really hard to answer it quickly <gasps> but you we don't have to be quick but just like short so that it's we can okay. keep the momentum going okay uh fill in the blank when I'm overworked blank helps fill the stress um switching my phone off and just spending time with my friends and partner. What is one of the most worthwhile investments you ever made? And it doesn't have to be financial. Worthwhile investments I ever made. Um, I mean, in, in Peach House, probably in myself and in George and believing in us. Yeah. Okay, and final question. <laughs> Borrowing from Inside the Actor's Studio, which was inspired by the famed French journalist Bernard Pivot. Mm -hmm. I love this question. I've always wanted to ask it. If heaven exists, <laughs> what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? And you can replace God with, you know, any entity. It doesn't have to be. Um, oh, God. Uh, not literally. Um, <laughs> um Ah, that's such a hard question. What would I want to hear him say? Um, I guess welcome, if he's welcoming me into heaven. But I don't know. Um, I don't know. Well done for making it. I love it. I think that's great. I think that's great. Well, thank you for playing my, my lightning round questions. Um, I, I'm still 
seeing uh, if it's something that is fun but i i no, like, I like it i think that. you should i think you should use the wine one for the yeah it's, i'm gonna it's more it was fun. a lot more fun more, more fun, fun for sure yeah um yeah, and the other honest, one the other one was loaded <laughs> yeah. very, very deep um but no i mean i i could talk to you forever uh, as i can with most people that i bring on because i choose the people to bring on yeah. for reasons that i have and and you're lovely and i'm so glad our paths have crossed oh. and Thank that you, you know you you're just off doing amazing things across the pond as they say so um, <laughs> is that what they say the cr the pond yeah yeah right? yeah across, across the, the pond, pond. Okay. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um, um, we didn't so i don't know you. we didn't really touch on the differences between the uk and the us that much but i don't know which i know you wanted to but yeah that's okay that's um, on me we got into some other really cool interesting places so that's what I, why I love doing it because I'll go in being like, oh, that's what this episode's going to be about, I think. And then it's not like at all. This yeah. episode's going to be about negotiating and self-worth and confidence and all these other amazing things that like I had no yeah. idea we were going to necessarily talk about. So it's amazing. Um, uh, so I thank so you. My pleasure. So much. This is amazing. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time mm -hmm. and sharing a little bit with me and the listeners. So thank you um, so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very humbled to be part of it. So of course. Um, thanks for having me. You're very um, welcome. <laughs>